thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, I'm not so young, you know, plastic surgery. <laughs> okay, so first of all, this is actually a record for me. Uh, I've never been presenting, uh, especially on a topic like this, and had so many women in the, in the audience. So, so, so um, congratulations, Sirka, for having, having such great inclusion. Yeah, fantastic. It's fantastic, yeah. Normally, normally it's the exact opposite. So, so, uh, so thanks a lot for, for coming. So, what I wanted to kind of talk about today, the titles a little bit um, um, general, but really a little bit more than just the CGI are, but how, how I think big data is going to change the, the trajectory of agricultural development over, over the coming uh, decade. Um, so it's a little bit more general about uh, big data. And so, so, when I've been working now for 15 years, and I was saying last time I was here, uh, it was um, uh, in 2000, and it was the first work trip I ever did. I was 22 years old. Now you know how old I am. Um, and um, I was doing stuff on spatial analysis of biodiversity and plant genetic resources, and our problem was always that we didn't have enough data. Right? So we had all sorts of great ideas, we had lots of problems, but our problem We'd spend 90% of the time trying to get data, cleaning data, so that then we can do the fun bit and analyze it and find patterns. And so now in 2016, the problem is almost the opposite. We have tons of data out there and we don't know what to do with it, right? So it, now the challenge is making sense of all of that data. And so that's, that's a fundamental change in the, in the, in the kind of state of, of science that we have. It's a huge opportunity, and I think it's actually kind of over the coming decade, the, the, the next generation of, of, uh, of, um, of scientists and kind of breakthroughs in agricultural science are going to be focused around novel solutions to having too much data. So the, it's the analytical side of things. So in Moore's, uh, Moore's law is, is used commonly in genetics uh, and in computer science, the kind of every year we get better and the, the price of sequencing, the price of processing goes uh, exponentially down. And, uh, uh, and so we've, we've seen this, maybe, maybe some of you have seen this in, in genetics, that uh, we've really followed this kind of amazing revolution in terms of processing. The same is happening in space as well. So this is also another real uh, amazing dynamic that we have right now. We've gone from satellite imagery being very difficult to acquire to having now drones, these handheld little satellites, and incredible amounts of information being captured every second of every day of the land surface, and we can learn so many more things from that. So, so we have we have this revolution in in, in, in the capture of information that is incredibly relevant for, for agriculture. So, so these are these these are my my friends, my colleagues from from SIA back in Colombia with their with their drones. They're doing uh, some interesting work. They're also kind of enjoying themselves a lot. They call themselves the Game of Drones. Um, but this is this is presenting. This is what just one example of a huge wealth of information that's being generated uh, every second. And so I'm sure on social networks you're all connected with with uh, with Facebook and Instagram and all these things. And so you see these kinds of things. But you know every minute of every day the amount of information that's being generated is just phenomenal. And um, we, we generally kind of see it as on a kind of personal basis, as kind of a, you know, information useful for kind of personal uh, issues. But, but at the same time, this is creating all sorts of incredible resources for agricultural research as well, um, from, from weird and wonderful sources that you wouldn't ever imagine. So one of the things that's kind of always uh, the, the, the impression is that the kind of digital revolution is something which is um, happening in, in, in the West, in the North, in, uh, in Europe, in US, and countries that are emerging economies or developing countries are kind of lagging behind on this. But, but there's so much data that shows that that's false. Um, in 16 years, internet access has gone from 0 to 30% in developing countries. I mean, that's a tremendous, that's a huge uh, number of people gaining internet access over 16 years. The UN, uh, were their, um, um, their mission was, their goal was to reach 50% by 2015, they hit 
And if you track this over a linear trend in 22 years, the whole world will have internet access. And I think that'll actually be much less than 20, 22 years. So, you know, this, it's nowadays, you know, with farmers, it's hard to find a farmer that doesn't have a phone. It might not be a smartphone, it might not be an apple, but nevertheless, they're connected through a phone. Um, and actually, if you look at internet access and internet usage statistics, the Philippines is above the US. It has higher internet access than the US. And so that is, um, for me, a, a total game changer. That's a huge opportunity for agricultural development. When you look at countries like Africa, um, you have um, trends of, of, even in, in, in some of the least developed countries, you have trends of, of, of gaining access. So this is not a kind of rich versus poor thing. We have, um, uh, just like mobile phones did in the, in the 2000s, now in the 2010s, kind of 3G networks and, and access to kind of internet and uh, data services is, is on the rise. So 50% of global population have access to a 3G network, which is, which is fantastic. Cell phones. Did you know there are more cell phones? People have, uh, there are more people with access to a cell phone than they have access to a toilet. That's, that's, that's actually a, a, a global statistic. And so, so again, this is, this, through this, uh, you have access to 6 billion uh, 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 mobile subscriptions. So a vast majority of people, it might not be 3G, it might not be, internet-based, but they will have access through, how, through a cell phone for calls, for SMS, and it's very hard now to find a place where, 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 where that's not happening. So you have enormous opportunities for generating information through, through, through ICTs and cell phones, and also sending information through uh, ICTs and cell phones. So 75% of the world has access to mobile phones, and that's every day changing. So, all of this is kind of positive, positive technological change, but there's also the, one of the concerns is, that, is this kind of widening uh, equity issues. So I always use the example, I could, I could through my phone right now figure out where the nearest restaurant is, where I can find a good pasta lunch, I can find out the cost of every hotel around, I can look at ways and I can figure out how many minutes it will take me to get to Manila Airport if I had to go to Manila Airport. So I have at my fingertips just a tremendous amount of information. Whereas, take a rural farmer, move 10 kilometers outside of Los Banos, a rural farmer, and ask them what do they have that helps make their job and their life easier? And it's probably very limited. And so we do have a concern, and I think this is very valid, about the kind of digital revolution driving inequity further. Within the ag sector, you have um, farmers in the, in the West with enormous range of services, apps, information resources, um, arriving at their doorsteps, arriving through their mobile phones to help them make farming easier, better, more profitable. And rural farmers in developing countries, are, are, there's a complete lack of those kinds of uh, resources. So there is an equity issue in this. So I think it's, it's the responsibility of science and researchers engaged in, in agricultural development to look for solutions that, that can overcome them. The gender gap as well is an interesting one. So women are about 50% less likely than men to use the internet in poor urban communities. And so you have a gender issue there as well. So technology, rather than solving some of our equity issues, potentially driving greater inequity issues. So, so this is one of the challenges that we have. Um, and so I, I kind of... Uh, um, always use the phrase of kind of democratization of big data. How can we make this revolution, this digital revolution, truly democratic and, and actually uh, uh, solving problems of inequity rather than driving them? And the final thing is, is, is youth, right? I mean, this is the really interesting thing. I, uh, these are my, this is my daughter and my, my son. I think they're two and four or maybe three and five in that photo. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and then you can see them penetration of technology for youth is way faster. <laughs> um, and so um, I think this is a, an opportunity to engage youth uh, and in agriculture. We have a big problem right now of agriculture just not being an attractive uh, career for a farmer, um, uh, for a young person growing up in a rural area. They're looking for more 
exciting uh, opportunities. They're looking to migrate out of rural areas. And so this is also, these, I think the, the kind of digital revolution provides an opportunity to make farming a little bit more interesting, a little bit more sexy, as I, as I like to say. And, 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 and I think you know, this, is, this is the real, real opportunity for them. So, so what we're trying to do, we're, we're really uh, in the CGIR, we're across the different centers. Erie, I work for SEAT, uh, based in Columbia. There are 15 centers in the CGIR, for those of you not familiar with it. Um, and so what we're trying to do is develop a kind of uh, a new business model for the use of these technologies. How can we develop uh, business models that's not kind of in the hands of Google and Monsanto and John Deere for farmers in the Midwest of the United States? but rather in the hands of smallholder farmers in developing countries so that they have opportunities, they, they uh, benefit from some of the opportunities from big data. So, so the big question is how do we close these equity gaps instead of widening them? And that presents all sorts of really exciting opportunities. So the data revolution is really, I think, changing the role, the reach, and the modus operandi of research and development organizations. It's changing the way we do things. From the upstream research in genomics and sequencing to kind of the development of uh, 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 new technologies, down to the ways in which we engage with farmers, the ways in which we do extension work with farmers. So um, it represents this unprecedented opportunity, I think, to find new ways of, com uh, of uh, reducing hunger and poverty. Um, and so that's where we're working on. So just, just. Before I, I'm going to give you some nice examples of some of the, uh, of the work that we're doing. Uh, but what we're developing is this big, this uh, big data and agriculture platform across the CGIR, where we're looking to solve development problems faster, better, and at greater scale through these kinds of big data analysis. Um, and so what we're doing is kind of organizing. One thing is getting 50 years, 60 years, there are institutions around the world with 100 years of agricultural research data that is just being lost when people uh, retire. It's, it's in the sea of C drives um, that laptops that get kind of damaged or C drives that just simply disappear and the data just vanishes into, into thin air. So we have a big challenge to make sure that we're systematically capturing information, uh, storing it and making it available. So because data is a resource now, data is a commodity that um, um, has value and in future um, uh, research is, 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 is always is, the demand for it is going to be increasing. So we want to find new ways of, of managing that, of collecting it and, and storing it and making it available, making it fully accessible. Second is convening it. So this is something the agricultural sector is not an expert on big data analytics, on machine learning, on all, on all sorts of kinds of approaches that these new uh, technologies uh, require. So it's also a question of bringing in new partnerships. So how can we make agriculture kind of sexy for IBM or for Google to engage in and start providing services? So we're looking there to bring, bring this kind of convention around big data in agriculture and in, in, in agricultural world. Then the third is inspire. So we want to inspire, use all of this potential and show how it can make a difference. So there we have the idea of these pilot projects to, to, to inspire through the use of big data. So that's, that's a little bit of the platform that we're, we're cooking up uh, uh, right now and working. And what it needs in the agricultural sector is a behavior change. So it's, it, it's not thinking about big data as needing big computers and big, big processing facilities. It's about really having big ideas about how to use this and, and apply it in your domain. So it's about reusing data that maybe not, wasn't originally designed to answer a specific question. Um, so some of the biggest great breakthroughs have been accidental. When you use something uh, in science that wasn't, that it wasn't necessarily designed for, use it out of its discipline or try something different on, on, on something that already exists. So I think there's a big opportunity for reusing, combining data sets and analyzing these with, with, with enormous creativity. So uh, that's, it's, it, it requires a bit of a behavior change uh, in agriculture. And so to do this, we're bringing in, we have 42 partners. Can you read all of that? <laughs> um, so we're bringing 42 partners, some of them from the, the kind of global brands on big data analytics like Google and IBM and Amazon, 
down to uh, entrepreneurial upstart companies in Kenya, for example, who are providing services to farmers, or uh, market information and things like that. So we're trying to combine all these things. So now I, I want to move into just one kind of domain where we're applying this and give you some examples of, of, of how it's changing uh, the way we can go about doing things. So, um, uh, I'll show you work that uh, yeah, we're doing in, on climate change related issues, putting the climate variable into, into agricultural development in, um, uh, in Colombia. And so really it's about data driven climate smart agronomy. So it's changing, about, changing the way we go about extension and the way we go about agronomic research. So what we're doing, this is a big agreement that we have with the uh, Colombian government. And it, really what we're looking to do in a, in a, on a grand scale, on a national scale, is avoid crop losses due to climate variability. So the Philippines has just gone through a pretty nasty drought, I understand. Um, I'm sure next year you'll have nasty, nasty floods. It's, it's kind of, now the, the norm is variability rather than a normal year. And as a friend of mine says, there is no average year. Every year is different. Uh, and so what we're looking to do is avoid crop losses due to that climate variability. We're also looking to close yield gaps. So climate variability, and, and, and it's an opportunity for a farmer to opti optimally manage as well. So um, um, it's a question of, of um, using appropriate management in very specific climates where farmers are growing their, their, their products. And then produce the food sustainably as well. So synergistically with the environment, reduce carbon footprints, reduce uh, water footprints. So I'll focus in really on the one and two with this with this thing. And so one of the things that, that kind of the, the mentality crop losses look, look a little bit like kind of a dry a dry crop that's kind of uh, been heavily impacted by drought or or heat, um, and where it's a it's just a disaster where you've lost most of the crop. What we're trying to do is change that mentality that crop loss is actually occurring every single day, every single hour out in the field through little variables. So it could be just a high minimum temperature at night during a critical time in rice that can just, just eat, eat away at the productivity that you're going to get. And so we're looking really at these subtleties, not crop losses due to flooding or due to drought, but, but the little effects that climate is having on agricultural productivity on a day-by-day -day basis. And what we're dreaming is this idea of kind of, um, you know, you can, you can do on your phone, hey Siri, uh, what time is it in, in Los Baños? Well, we want to do the idea of, well, hey, hey CG, we work for the CGIR, when should I black maize? Um, and so these kinds of questions, how can we answer those kinds of questions for farmers in very intelligent ways and in ways that are personalized? This is the, the whole uh, movement right now, the obsession in Silicon Valley, the obsession in all of the services that are coming to your mobile farms is personalization. And the farmers deserve that personalization as well. And so it's, it's moving away from the idea of blanket recommendations into personalized recommendations that is for your farm, for your conditions, your context. And so that's, that's the other, this requires kind of new ways of going about agronomic research agricultural research. So, so the, this is the kind of a general approach that we're using. We're, we're, we're moving away from using experimental farms and experimental stations to, to do a, an agronomic experiment where you control one variable and see how the productivity changes. It's moving out into the real world, into the noisy, complex world of actual farms. And so you see the farmer Every farmer is a scientist. Every farmer is doing an experiment every time he or she decides to plant or to plant a variety or to apply fertilizer or to weed. So all of these are experiments and all of it is generating incredibly valuable information. We've just been terrible at capturing it, analyzing it and making sense of it because it's too noisy in general. And so from an agronomic research perspective that's been very difficult in the past. So go back to the experimental station and control one by one with variables. We're looking to kind of change that mentality. So you use noisy commercial data. So farmers, what are they doing? Where are they growing their crops? Under what conditions? What are they doing? And try and understand from all of that, not from five farmers or ten farmers, but from 
thousands of farmers that you, you're engaged with to see the, the, the picture, see the signal through all of the noise that you have between uh, farms. And so what we're looking at is kind of uh, the, the variables of climate. A, 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 a farmer is, is living within a specific climate. Within a, uh, the, the production is occurring within a soil with specific crop management. And coming out of that, you have productivity and you have quality of, of the product. Right? What we want to do is understand all of that relationships. And so then we go into this, this uh, um, analytics framework. So how can we pull out of that data uh, signals and, and messages and patterns? And then throw that back in very easy to use uh, uh, terminology and personalized for farmers to be able to say, well, look, if you were to do this differently, we believe that your productivity could increase by X amount. So it's, it's, it's producing that kind of recommendation. Then it's up to the farmer to decide with all of their knowledge and their local knowledge what, what is best. But it's adding a little bit of analytics into, into the mix, into the decision making process. So, so one of the challenges from an agricultural science perspective is, is getting the data, but then once you have that data, how to analyze it. So it needs new approaches. So this is where really I think agricultural science departments need to be linking up with electronic engineering and with um, uh, statistics departments to figure out new ways of analyzing this data. And so we've been using all sorts of things like uh, machine learning, neuro, uh, uh, neural nets, um, using um, deep learning now is one of the approaches that's, that's coming up, random forest. And so these are all new methods for, for, for analyzing these kinds of dirty data sets, um, and also traditional, using traditional approaches, but it needs kind of new, new tools for new, new uh, uh, problems. And so, I'll give you one example of, in Colombia, of what where we've done this over, over a period of about two to three years. Um, this is a maize growing region. Um, we had, uh, the problem in maize we had, we were working with the Trade Federation and the producer organization of maize in Colombia. They were desperate to kind of develop this stuff, but they had no data. So without any data, we couldn't do anything. So we set up an app that got linked into the extension system, and the app basically went registering what we call productive events, and I'll explain what that is in a minute, and capturing on farm what's going on, of, uh, with what is a farmer doing, when are they planting, what variety they're planting, um, uh, and what kinds of conditions was that. Um, we then throw at it data and analysis. So we generate for each farm, we, in this case we had 238 farms participating in this around a number of years. So each, each farm is not a data point, but each productive event is a, is a, so each five month cycle is a data point for us. So the same farm could have three different, very different climate conditions that is very useful information for us in terms of the climate relations. So we generate all of these are variables, and I won't go into them, and you can't see them anyway. Um, but um, variables of soil, variables of climate during the, those events, and we're using satellite imagery and local rainfall stations to fill in that climate information. Um, management, so when did they plant, what did they plant, what was the fertilizer use, input use, what was the kind of labor um, um, use there. there. And so, we generate all of these variables, and then we throw all sorts of uh, uh, data geeks at the, at the problem. So the data geeks mine it to death. They find, look out for patterns. And this is the kind of thing that comes out. So in one slide, the learning that you can have from this case study, which is just 238 farms, basically, in one problem. And so we have all of these variables, and you can't see it very well, but um, what it should, what sh should be here is these are the um, different variables, and this is the amount of variability and productivity that it explains. And so we can figure out immediately which are the variables that are driving yield variability the most. And some of them are kind of expected for agronomists, for standard scientists. Others are actually quite a surprise, and it brings up new questions from a research, from a research perspective. So why is that variable uh, affecting? So for example, in rice, from work, other work we're doing, we're figuring out all sorts of new things about the relationship minimum temperatures and rice productivity, which were unexpected. Um, different levels of threshold, different response rates and all sorts. 
But these are the kinds of things we find, and they're non-linear relationships. So for example, slope issues and drainage was, was very important. Phosphorus, 25 kilograms per hectare is kind of the minimum, but once you go over, I think it was 45, you're not getting any more response from the crops. So there's no point in putting any more up. Change the harvest method from manual to mechanized, no surprise there, move to, move to uh, mechanization. But then um, plant population, a 20 day after germination came out, it was really crucial. So planting density was, was, was uh, uh, crucial at 65 plants per hectare. And so we came out with then the link back to farmers. We used this idea of crop check, which is a, an approach developed in Chile where it's, it's a minimal set of kind of best practices that a farmer should use. Um, and so we diluted these kind of all of this variability into five management things that a farmer should do. Um, and if you do those five, we think you'll have much higher productivity. And so um, those went back into this um, ICT app that we had and back through into the extension system to, to the farmers. And so this is this graph I'll, I'll, I'll move and show you. So this graph, you can all hear me, right? So, so this graph shows um, three different groups of farmers. This, this is the group of farmers, this is their yield, who do none of those five. Their average is around 3,500, 3.5 tons per hectare of maize. Farmers that do some of the, those five things can move up to here, just over 4, 4.3 tons per hectare. So they can move over there. The farmers, and this is real data, the farmers that are doing all five of those things are getting over six tons. So it's quite simple. You can move from doing none of those to doing all five. You can move from 3.5 to six tons. That's huge, absolutely huge. So these are the kinds of insights we're, we're, we're producing. And, and the team that's doing this actually got a, 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 a UN data a, a climate challenge, a big data climate challenge uh, prize for, for this work uh, from the UN. Um, and, and that's them with the uh, uh, Assistant Secretary General of the UN. The other thing that we're doing that's really innovative is bringing in um, climate, better climate data into this. And so the idea is seasonal forecasting. So this is the weather forecast, but for a farmer, not, not the next five days, but the next five months. So that they can make targeted decisions about more than anything when to plant and what variety they should plant. And so we've been doing work on, on using all of these climate models and regional climate models to creating scenarios over the next cropping season of the likely climate on a very site-specific basis that the uh, farmers are going to experience. So we create these kinds uh, of graphs. I'll, I'll show you this one rather. So this one shows, this was a real case from last, last year. We, have, we issued this in July. Um, this is for July. Uh, this was in June. We are issued it from July to December. This is the um, 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 this is the maximum temperature that we're expecting. Um, this is the average, and this is what we were expecting. And uh, for precipitation, this is the averages of the bars, and this is what we were pro uh, projecting, what the forecast was saying. So we had this forecast showing precipitation de deficits and high. Temperate, maximum temperatures. And so that was the basis for then this kind of modeling, where we looked at different planting dates and three different varieties uh, in one specific site for rice. And we came out with this saying basically, first of all, plant now. Don't wait. Your productivity is going to go down for every week that you wait. If you do wait, make sure you go with, um, in this case, it was variety uh, FE733, uh, the green one which was going to significantly produce significantly more. So, um, so we had that kind of uh, recommendation, which we took out to the field and discussed with farmers, and uh, agreed regionally on a kind of hybrid uh, uh, recommendation that was fed into uh, uh, extension. And then what we did is we kind of measured, well, what actually happened? And so temperatures were much higher. We had a rain gauge measuring precipitation, and um, precipitation was lower than we expected. So the seasonal forecast on, the, agri on the, the climate side was working. And then we looked at what happened in fields with farmers who grew one variety over the other. And the blue variety, for example, Federal 60 had 4.6 tons. The green one had 6.8 tons. So again, 
we, we, we got the variety right. So, so these kinds of uh, intelligence and these services reaching farmers can have enormous uh, opportunity in terms of avoiding crop losses and maximizing yield. And actually what happened was in one region we, did, we issued one of these and, and um, a number of farmers, I'm sorry this is, oh no, it's, it is in uh, English. Um, one of the, the farmer groups in the region decided not to plant. So they had 1,800 hectares of rice that they didn't plant because of the seasonal forecast. I, 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 I got very nervous, right, because they were, if, if I was wrong, they were going to lose a lot of money. But actually what happened is the neighbors who did plant lost their crop because of maximum temperatures. And so, so they were enormously um, um, happy with this. And now there's huge demand for these kinds of services um, across the country. The other thing, the other interesting thing you can do is historical profiling. So, so we, 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 we're so good at forgetting history and, and writing off history and kind of always, always looking forward. It's a good thing, right? But I mean, we actually had huge amounts of learning over the last uh, uh, 50 years. And so um, this learning can just be bolstered through these kinds of approaches. Look at um, a, a farmer, there's a kind of famous farmer once, once said that, you know, I only have 40 um, uh, 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 goes in my life of producing a good crop because they, they, with one cycle per year, they have 40 years basically of, of, of farming to get it perfect. If you, you know, that's for one farmer, but you have two billion farmers in the world, and so for, if two billion farmers are getting 40 goes at it, then do the maths. You have a huge amount of opportunities to learn from those. Affected. So we've been working a lot on historical profiling, and so identifying, kind of doing the forecast into the future, and figuring out well when in the past did we have conditions similar to our forecast? So when were temperatures maximum temperatures high and precipitation low? And then figuring out where are the what happened in those. So we found out that it's for for example cluster seven in this case um, of uh, the, the historical climates. And then we look, well, what did different varieties produce under those conditions that we're expecting? So there you can also make decisions about what worked in the past and, and learn systematically from it. So all of this data, what we do is we create it, we put it out through extension, through ICTs, we put it out through national portals and through the Ministry of Agriculture. And we're trying to, trying to the dissemination side of things is a real challenge and we're pushing very hard on that, so we have these bulletins and an online thing. But really what's interesting is it's making ag agricultural extension sexy again. And so farmers generally are kind of getting skeptical of agricultural extension because they always hear the same thing. It's, it's very much a kind of recipe-based approach, blanket recommendations. And farmers, there's, 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 if you look at the data, there's more mistrust. Those that get extension, which is very few of them, but those that do get it are also having uh, less and less trust in. And that's partly because we have much more wild weather, we have um, climate variability on the increase. Um, and so extension is so lacking the tools and the information to be able to provide the farmers with the personalized information that they need. And so this is an opportunity really to make agricultural extension more, more sexy, more interesting, and more dynamic. And the places where we're doing this, you're finding the demand for extension is just going through the roof. There's much more interest in receiving this kind of service. Um, the key is the closing the loop, so having farmers sharing their information of what they're doing, learning from that, and throwing back recommendations that makes it valuable to the farmers to then continue sharing their experiences. So it's, it's, it's really about kind of kicking, kick-starting this, this process of sharing. So just to close, this is, this is a kind of classic graph, if you look in many areas, over, over the years of growth in a commodity. You first of all, um, it could be, you could look at um, oil palm in, in, uh, um, in Southeast Asia, for example. It starts with an imported technology that takes off. Then you have research starts kicking in, and you have locally adapted technologies developed. And then with those locally adapted technologies, you have locally adapted agronomy. So this has been a classic kind of development stage of, uh, for crops um, across regions. And, and what we're finding, what we're kind of betting on is that the next is this data-driven agronomy and technology development. So it's, it's, it's adding data to that mix of uh, development. And, and we think that'll be the next step up. 
And in the few places where we've managed to do this, we're already seeing that curve um, um, uh, starting, to, starting to happen. So I, I, I'm going to close there. I think this, it, there's enormous opportunities. And, and I know CFK is a kind of educational uh, organization. So for the next generation of agricultural scientists, you know, I think this kind of thinking and these kinds of approaches are going to become more and more important in your jobs into the future. So that was why I chose this topic. And, uh, very happy to answer questions now for the discussion. Thank you very much, Dr. Jarvis. Let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you so much for sharing with us how CGIR now uses or manages this information, this wealth of information to make a difference in the life of uh, in the lives of the farmers. So the floor is now open for your comments, insights, and questions. Please use the microphone along the aisles and please identify yourself. Who's going to shoot the first question? Yes. Nancy Burgos, yeah. Earlier you mentioned about the participation of, uh, of uh, CIA in the AMIA project of uh, the Department of Agriculture. How do you tend to use uh, operationalize the big data analytics in this uh, program? Okay, well, here are the two experts, right? They're going to be doing a lot of the work here. Yeah? But um, I, I think one of the things that we're going to start, the first, one of the first steps that we're going to be moving on with that project is, is some of the, the, the forecasting work on climate. Um, I think that's, that's an area that, that many met Met offices across the world have been doing, but there's been uh, there's a huge amount of work to translate what a Met office creates, which is millimeters per, per day or millimeters per month, into tons per hectare. It's the translation of that um, those forecasts, which is which is the challenge right now. So that's that's I guess that's going to be one of the, the first things to look at. We're going to be doing a lot of characterization work in that project, so vulnerability analysis to understand. The climate kind of constraints that um, are, are holding agriculture back or, 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 or reducing yields uh, across the country. So we'll be doing the vulnerability assessment work, and then looking at some of the practices and technologies that uh, are most suitable to tackle climate variability and climate challenges. Uh, so there we'll be doing some economic analysis of that. So that's that's in that context uh, of this project, kind of immediately immediate phase right now. I'd love it to go in this direction and, 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 and push the kind of data driven. Given that the Philippines beats the U.S., you can beat the U.S. in services as well to farmers uh, through through things like this. Yeah, uh, I think 
I've been doing this kind of talk in a number of uh, universities up in the US. There's huge interest in it, but very little. It, it's not been mainstreamed into the kind of uh, curricular, the mentalities of the, of the, the, the professors doing the teaching. So, um, so I think I, it's 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 got to grow. I think um, over the years. But yeah, I mean, you, you could be a you could be here the the fast starter and one of the pioneers in doing it potentially. But it is it, it absolutely needs. It's impossible without the translation, and that requires agricultural extension. Uh, yes, sir. Because uh, you know we have a. Uh, uh, a law, the Agricultural, Agricultural Fisheries Modernization Act, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, enacted in 1997. And uh, one of the provisions there is uh, the uh, uh, development of the so called National Information Network. Uh, you know, that law has been Enacted in 1997, so that is about 20 years already, and until now it has not been it has not been organized at all. Now, uh, if many organizations are already in active and then uh, uh, we can access it, do you think that do you think the the Philippines or the Department of Agriculture still need to establish that? Information network system. I, I mean, I'm not an expert in the Philippines. My, my expertise is about 36 hours so far. But um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, it needs to kind of move into this kind of things. It needs strong commitment, and it needs it from policy and government side of things down to the, the professors and the, and, the, and the students that are that are in the in the, the universities, and then out to the kind of public system and the private system of, of extension. It, it, it needs a kind of, I think this is why it's, it's been so hard to get this moving in rural areas, because there's a lot of inertia in the system. And, uh, and there's a lot of skeptics of these approaches. There's a lot of um, just lack of capacity to, 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 to engage on it. Um, so it, it, I think that's holding it back. But, um, if you have that legislation and that kind of context within the Philippines, I mean, you could use that to, 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 to try try things different. I mean, I, you know, I think I think um, I say this to every kind of country I go to. Right? You know, if you really jump on this, you've got a you've got a real opportunity uh, to be a world leader. You know, it's, there's no there's no leader right now on this. Um, it's it's a new area. It's an exciting area with huge potential. I think. And, uh, jump on it. Go. from computer science. I'm just, uh, I saw the, the logo R. Aside from using the R programming language, do you have a specialized computing setup? Because I saw there are around 200 plus variables that does gonna take a lot of computing power. Do you, do you have a system or can you elaborate? Yeah. What, so, what tools do you use? Or? So we've invested in a kind of cluster that we have within our offices for doing a lot of this analysis. Um, and so, but I mean, in general, I mean, it, big data is the buzzword, and it kind of it, it brings in the audience. From a computer science perspective, this is not big data. I mean, it's lots of variables for agriculture. It's big data. It's kind of lots of commercial data out there, but but it's it's not hugely com computationally intensive. Um, we do have a cluster that we that we, we, we do the analysis on. It's 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 modest. It's not massive. Um, uh, uh, but we are kind of, we're trying through this partnership that we're developing, we're trying to get Amazon um, uh, AWS services for, for this kind of stuff. Um, and I mean, our vision for this is kind of develop lots of the methods and the approaches, but then private sector take over, doing, generating services in, in, in rural areas um, and, and, and making, making new business models for, for agriculture. Uh, populations on this instead of tailoring for the rich urban dweller. Right? That's, that's where the money is right now to develop an app. But if we can make you know make the, the kind of the 
the business case for doing this for a farmer, then, then, then that's the real way that this will reach scale. But it's not massively complex on a computational perspective yet. <laughs> Mark, I am um, You have mentioned about climate forecast and all those other climatic information that can be used by farmers. Uh, one aspect of uh, helping our farmers is on the, the profitability side. And I, I have, there was no information uh, uh, mentioned about price forecasting or maybe cost reducing, like you mentioned yeah. crop management practices that you want farmers to adopt. But of course, in adopting those practices, practices, there are costs associated to it. So do you provide information like if you adopt hybrid seeds or maybe these practices, what are the additional costs that they will incur? So I think those information are also important in order to, to help them uh, increase their income. Or their income. Yeah, absolutely. One, one, of the, one of the reasons why farmers in general, in areas where we've been generating these seasonal forecasts, one of the reasons why farmers are so interested in it is that um, in areas where you have a kind of very marked start of the wet season, so for example in West Africa we've been doing some stuff on this, in setting up. And so for the farmers that are getting this information, they get their crop in the field first. Because they have the, the forecast of when the rains are going to come and they have the certainty from that forecast to be able to make a, kind of make a, um, a calculated risk and, 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 and plant early. Um, and so they then get huge market advantage when, when they harvest because they're the, first, they're the first to market and they're not within the kind of boom when everyone's harvesting. So that's, that's, that's been one example of kind of on the economic side why, how it can also help on prices. Um, it also, there's kind of lots of things you can do with this on yield forecasting, which from a, from a market management perspective at national scales is also um, useful for understanding kind of predicting price and managing uh, the market a little bit more effectively. Um, I guess most of the kind of economics on input costs and all those things we're addressing, but it's going, that's going through this trade federation, the farmer organizations that are involved. So, so we're not doing the modeling per se or the analysis on that, but then that's, that's a, it's like a, a, a very important kind of context within which these decisions are made. And, uh, and you know, I mean, I think the key with all these things is always kind of humility in the way you, you give um, um, give these recommendations. It's not saying, look, do this, you know, you'll, you'll be better off. Um, it's saying, look, we've done this, the analysis suggests this, you know, you know best. You, they, you know, it's just giving additional in input for them to make a more informed decision. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, and, and all of those input costs doesn't have to be. Then, then 
it works just as well. So the, the, the idea in Colombia, many of those farmers are pretty, pretty smallholder, quite uh, 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 low income farms. It's much easier though. You can get the data really quick when it's, when it's kind of organized, mechanized farming. Yes, sir. Of generating new knowledge in new ways and new, new intelligence. 